Today, I'm joined by Simon Webb. He is a historian, uh, a prolific author. Um, he has penned over 40 Westerns uh, and also over 20 nonfiction books, uh, I think with a with a specialization in the area of social history. Um, he's a journalist. He's a, been a contributor to, to various news sources, a, a source uh, on, on historical matters. So um, thank you so much for coming on, Simon. Oh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I wanted to talk to Simon uh, for for a while now, uh, as I'm a fan of his uh, channel on YouTube, which most people should, uh, most people, everyone should check out um, if you haven't yet. It's called History Debunked. Um, and I remember it was a, 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 sm- a relatively small channel the first time I, I checked in, It was a, which was not that long ago. Uh, but now it is a big channel and it has uh, gained uh, quite a significant following. Uh, and I think for very good reason. Uh, I love the format. It's very, um, there, there's no fluff. That's, if, if, any, if, if anything can be said about it, there's no fluff. Uh, and uh, it's, it addresses a lot of the subjects that uh, I talk about on this show, uh, but from a historical perspective. And also, I think, yeah, debunking is probably the best uh, adjective to, to, to add to it. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a shining light on, on a lot of the, the, the matters of the day. Um, uh, I wonder what what made you um, because a lot of these subjects are, are quite controversial. What 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 was this decision like to to come out and start producing content? On, I would say on, on an industrial scale to, to debunk all of these all of these modern myths. I think it's possibly because they see people seem reluctant to discuss certain things. People don't want to say things out loud. In fact, it's not only people don't want to say things; they don't want to ask questions and that's a terrible state of affairs when people feel unable to ask a question about something you've got to ask yourself what's going on so it's partly that yes i mean that that's partly also the <laughs> the the motivation for this podcast um i i i wonder um you you are a, a not only a UK resident, you are a, a British man. You've lived in the UK for, for most of your life. That's your history. That's your tradition. Um, I wonder how has the, the UK changed throughout the course of your life? Um, uh, th- this is relevant to me, especially because I've lived in the UK and I moved to the UK because uh, I love the UK. I'm very, very fond of, of, of your cultural the heritage of, of the traditions of, of everything that uh, that the UK comprises, but uh, living there, um, I could see that not everyone was would agree with me on that. So, um, yeah, I, I wonder how how you feel that things have changed. When I was younger, when I was a young man, people were proud of their country. People were proud of Britain, proud of what Britain has achieved, the things that have been done the Industrial Revolution, the defeat of Nazism and so on. Now they're ashamed of it. Many British people are actually ashamed of their country. They're ashamed of their traditions and ashamed of their history. And I find it disturbing. Yes. I mean, what what in particular do you see them be ashamed of? Do they have a, a, a logical vision or is it just a, a general malaise? <laughs> it seems to vary. Um, The shame over slavery has now mutated into a general shame for the British Empire, Mm. which is peculiar. But now there is a shame about the Industrial Revolution because of the supposed effects of climate change, you know, the carbon dioxide. Mm. This has been tracked back now to the Industrial Revolution. And, of course, Britain started the Industrial Revolution. So we're now responsible for climate change as well. And this is a really peculiar perspective to find one country blamed for everything wrong in the world. Yes, it does seem um, a bit of um, a, a problem that can only occur in a, in a kind of a first tier nation. It's it's almost um, in a way a kind of an affectation of of uh, royalty to to be able to to tear down your own uh, your own tradition in, in such a way. You would not. I mean. As a Romanian myself, no one would do something like that here. It just doesn't, it does not compute. <laughs> we did not have an empire, but we there, there were some bad things happening here as well. But you've we- had bad people in charge. 
I mean, you're in Transylvania, you've got Vlad Dracul. So, <laughs> yeah. But your people don't go about worrying about that. And, no, people you know, love Vlad himself. Dracul here. He's seen as a, as a folk of hero. <laughs> yeah, of course he is. He's resistant. He, he was fighting against the Turks, of course. Oh. You're proud of him. But you don't go around saying, oh, it's so terrible, all the impalings, all the dreadful things that <laughs> happened under him. It would be completely mad. Yes, especially because the, the the Turks obviously being people of color, I can't even imagine <laughs> under under you. a modern lens, it would be very bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would be Islamophobia before you know it if you That's say too right. much about that. Any any resistance to Turkish imperialism is Islamophobia. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. This is guilty of that. <laughs> um, that's also an, an interesting perspective. That um, the the only colonialism that exists and the only um, imperialism um, is is particularly um, part of the the British Empire and its offshoots. And no one else has ever done anything like it. <laughs> In in history, and I think that that's one thing I love about your about your deep dives is that you not only highlight them, but you also ex- explain the um the extent of of you know past colonialism. And um, I, I I wonder how when when was the inflection point? Because this this stuff used to be taught in schools, at least partially, and then Thank now yeah. now there isn't any. Now it's not. I think perhaps the nineteen seventies were the tipping point. There, if there was a tendency then uh, towards iconoclasm. There was a tendency to throw down the old certainties, to to mock heroes, you know, to make fun of the people that were held uh, in high esteem, which is a healthy enough thing. I, I've no objection to that. But then it turned into something darker. It turned into a rejection of history, a rejection of values and customs. Yeah. And then, of course, at the same time, if you say um, in British imperialism became the only imperialism. I don't have to tell you about um, Turkish Ottoman imperialism because, of course, your, your country suffered from it. The Slav countries suffered from it. The Turks reached the gates of Vienna. They were trying to destroy Europe, uh, eradicate Christianity. It was a jihad. But it's considered impolite now to mention that. It's impolite to mention the Ottomans. It's impolite to mention Turkish imperialism which is still going strong. The Turks are still an imperialist nation now. You know, they're they're still trying to expand and suppress minorities. But people won't talk about that. They will only talk about white imperialism. Exactly. And also uh, of the um, kind of the the positive externalities of imperialism, because I live in, in Transylvania now, which is, I mean, obviously, some people from the south of Romania might not agree with me, but I, I think it's still kind of an elevated region because it used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You can see this mm. architecture, um, also some some local customs and administration, uh, in just the way things are structured um, politically here. It seems, you know, it's it's a bit less corrupt. It's always been a little bit richer since the since the Austro-Hungarians were here. So, it, I mean, the remnants of of this brutal occupation are quite positive. For for a lot of the people who who lived here, so I um, I wonder, especially given that the the at least from my perspective, the 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 British Empire had some some positive <laughs> effects for some for some regions, especially contrasting them to areas that have not been under imperial occupation. So I wonder if is is that not any empirical evidence that uh, it's it's not all so 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 dark and dire? You would think so, yes. You would think the fact that we gave the world a language and uh, the values of Magna Carta, you would think that the courts of India and African countries are based upon the British legal system and the burden of proof and jury trials and a whole lot of other things together with railways. And uh, There are an awful lot of things, but no, it doesn't seem to be taken into reckoning. Yes, but salmon does produce carbon. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Global warming, of course. Any any progress produces carbon, obviously. So, you know, <laughs> don't you? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I kid, but it's, uh, it, it's true. I mean, we, you could, you could look at, you know, the, the first uh, agricultural societies and blame them for everything that came in their wake. But yeah, that's a strange way of doing history. Um, I living living in the UK. Um, I I was kind of among um, people who 
um, we're kind of, you know, the middle class people who vote labor. They're good people. They make a, they make a show out of being good people. Uh, and they sometimes kind of entered into almost like a confessional uh, mode with me being uh, kind of the, the token immigrant at the party. Uh, and they would, would come up to me and kind of in a, in a, almost like a sullen way would, would explain to me that, you know, they would have never voted for Brexit. They love me. They want me here. Uh, and they're, they're good people. <laughs> so I was kind of a, a bit of a receptacle for their, for their, you know, prostration, so that <laughs> so that I knew that they were, you know, good, good, nice yeah. people, labor voters. So, um, I, I I wonder is is this um, an uh, an affectation across the country, or is this just you know relegated to to urban centers where I, I might find myself? It's middle class white people, left wing types that do this. That they, they adopt what they might. Uh, think of as good immigrants you're probably one of them and then they they, they're at length to show you that they like immigrants and that they're not prejudiced and how terrible it is that some people wanted to leave the european union yeah but it's you won't find this if you go into the countryside if you go to small villages people there aren't ashamed of feeling you know loving their country Yes, I, I've always loved uh, going to villages and, and also having having chats uh, with people in pubs in smaller communities. It was mm. a very very different type of type of discussion that that you you could also hear. You didn't even have to get involved. Even even just being in the pub, you could you could hear that you know this was not uh, this was not a, a labor zone. Most most of them. <laughs> so uh, it, it was really really fun to to see that, um, and it's. It, it was a, I don't know, it was a bit of a strange feeling to be kind of a covert conservative in these circles, because I would have probably voted, you know, uh, twice if I could for Brexit, but I, unfortunately I couldn't, but I could vote for mayor of London, which is an interesting quirk. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very strange thing. Um, but I, I don't know, in, in terms of, of the vote for, for um, mayoral candidates, this, this would never happen in a different kind. Like, for example, if you came to Romania as a foreign citizen, you wouldn't be able to vote for for any any. Yeah, it's a, um, I, I wonder. Is do you see any sort of um, um, attempt to expand the franchise beyond that to have recent immigrants be able to vote? There are attempts to expand the franchise. There, there's constant talk of allowing 16-year-olds to vote, you know, not just 18-year-olds. So, yes, that, that's certainly on the cards. For Labour, it's very advantageous to have young people and to have foreign people to be able to vote, obviously, because that's where their power base is, especially in big cities. So, yes, I, I can see that easily coming. Yes, yes, it's... um. It's a it's a strange thing being a being a foreigner in the UK because at the same time um, you I mean I kind of brought my, my relatively conservative sensibilities with me uh, and I feel like there's nothing that's going to um, maybe have the potential we on the internet it's called a red pill you know to the idea that you know you, you see something and you know it 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 really disturbs your your view of the world so so seriously that you kind of stepped outside of uh, of the you know uh, the the uh makeup of reality so um i i lived in east london for for most of my time in in london and the the fact that you know there was so so much crime so much violent crime uh and it was unpoliced and um there were these islands of you know very rich people in high rises that were kind of safe you know sometimes get mugged but there were also islands of constant terror <laughs> and, and and serious crime uh and for someone who who comes you know i come from romania this is kind of a very much a second third third tier country not very, you know, it's it's not a very rich country, but we don't have those problems and we haven't had those problems. We probably never had those problems. Uh, and just going there and you know, being afraid to walk outside at night, that's a, a very special kind of fear that you just don't cultivate. And also not having, you know, the, the Crime Stop software installed the, that, you know, the, you shouldn't notice this. Uh, I, I didn't know about that. So I was trying to talk to people about it and there was, they, there just wasn't any conceptual frame that they could address this. They would just say, oh, some, something, something is underfunded. Austerity is the problem. Why, why I'm mm -hmm. getting, you know, knives yeah. at me outside. So, um, 
it just felt to me like they, there was no perspective in, in people. They wouldn't allow themselves to, to understand any other view. You have to pretend not to notice it. You have to censor your own thinking, and it's, which is precisely, of course, what happens in 1984 when Winston Smith has to scald himself to make sure his expression is neutral because even your expression can get you into trouble when it, things like that are being discussed. You might raise your eyebrows if somebody's... Uh, for example, most violent street crime is carried out by black youth, young black people in East London, you know, most robberies from the person probably that is mugging. If somebody says that, or if somebody denies it, suppose, I mean, I've heard people say, well, that's not true. This is, sort of, you know, these, these are, it's because of the police figures. If you raise your eyebrows at that or look sort of incredulous, immediately you are regarded with suspicion. You are a little Englander. You are a racist. You are a xenophobe. And nobody wants to be excluded like that. People want to be accepted. And so they go along with it. They, they, they don't express doubts. They don't ask questions. They don't notice. They, they pretend things aren't happening. Yeah, so that seems to be um, my my feeling as well. Um, until something happens, I feel like people, you know, until something, like I've had a few friends who've had some, some serious encounters with violence. Uh, and then um, it's not like they, they start talking to everyone about this. But if you were the type of person to raise your eyebrows at least once or twice during <laughs> interactions with those people, they do come back to you and they start discussing these things. Uh, and they're like, okay, yeah, you might have a point. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, but it's coded. It's all secret because they wouldn't say it at a party where everybody could hear them. They'll catch the, your eyebrows going up and they'll think, aha, this is someone I can have a secret conversation with about reality. But again, that's absolutely grotesque that you should, you, you, you know, you shouldn't be able to discuss reality with people for fear of being excluded or censored. It's a bizarre situation. Yes, um, I, I used to when I was in London. I used to work for a quite a, pro a progressive type of, of of company, and you know, there's a lot of upsides to that. But there's also you know this kind of code of silence that you have to have about any sort of yeah. uh, conservative. Let me give you yeah. Let me give you an an um, a analogy. It would be as though you were living, say, in a village in Transylvania, and wolves were coming and attacking people or sniffing around and biting children. And nobody wanted to pretend it was happening. You can imagine the, even mentioning the wolves would be, people would look at you as if you were saying the wrong thing. And you would have to pretend that nothing was wrong and just put up with the wolves and leave them alone. That's exactly what's happening in uh, some developed countries. It's exactly what's happening in England. There's a serious situation developing and no one wants to talk of it. No one wants to even acknowledge it. Yes. Well, isn't it part and parcel of, of living in a big city? That's, that's what I kept hearing. It's just the city is big. That what's hap It's what happens in all big cities. It doesn't really happen in Tokyo, does it? So <laughs> It doesn't happen in Tokyo and it didn't used to happen in London or Birmingham. When it was a, a monocultural society, when it was just white people in the 1950s and 60s, it didn't happen. There was no knife crime. You know, if, if you heard of a stabbing, it was a, in headline in the newspapers. These days it's not. These days it's what passes for normal. Yes, and I, I remember like one, one of these mo mostly red-pilling <laughs> incidents that I had. We had a small co-op in the neighborhood and they were always these these kids and I think they must have been like maybe 12 or 13 years old and they, were, they, they had knives and they would just come and just essentially... Um, uh, shoplift everything out of the store and no one could say anything and we talked to the manager he was just a, an, an older polish man uh and he was like there's just there's nothing that we can do and i was like does corporate do anything and they said they're gonna move the store soon because it's just unsustainable um, and they were just stealing obviously high value things like detergent yeah. Of uh, course. Meat. And they all had co-op written on top of them in, in a desperate attempt by the manager to to warn the people who were buying these things off of the off of the people who stole them that they were stolen. So yeah, I, I don't know if it worked. I don't think these people care. But uh, what, part of, what part of London is that? Um I was living in, in Clapton, which was yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know up at Clapton Road. Yeah. Near Stamford Hill or more down towards Hackney? Um, kind of halfway between, actually. Mm. It was, um, where was it? Lee, close to Lee Bridge Road. Oh, I know, yeah. 
Yeah, it's it was a lovely place. I mean, the, the marshes are amazing. I, I miss them even now. We used to go for yeah. one every morning there. Um, it's it's a great area, but also you want to stay indoors after night, <laughs> to cool. be, especially on the towpath. You don't want to. Yeah, be yeah. Night. So yeah, there's there's all sorts of little pockets like that where you know, and and the thing is, I wouldn't even have known about the extent of it because it's not really on TV. You don't really know until it happens to you, but. We had like a WhatsApp group, a neighborhood WhatsApp group. So people were just posting saying, oh, no, I got mugged again this week. Uh, they stole this. You know, someone got stabbed. Someone died two blocks from here. So, you know, it was just kind of a tally of all of these events that were happening to just mm. people in our building complex. So, you know, <laughs> you know, the lying eyes school of empirical evidence was uh, was <laughs> racking up the, the data points there. So uh, and, and at one point, it just it just didn't feel like um, a good deal. To, to be living um and I, I say in london you know but particularly in, in this area i'm sure there are areas you know i'm sure in i don't know kensington might be a bit more uh i don't know relaxed yes on, kensington on and richmond of course around there around clapton you've got housing uh estates like Pem, uh, pembury and kingsmead housing estate and the youth from there go stealing in the middle class districts from where you're talking about if you go down towards the river there's some big houses and there's middle class people living there and the kids from the housing estates go down there hunting, you know, looking for people with money that they can steal from. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you could also see it on on the doors, you know, because we had we were living in kind of a, I don't know, middle class housing estate like that is probably it mm. was um, like a, a kind of a new build. It was a really nice, really nice apartment, but you could see the doors. The doors were all smashed in. You could see people, yeah. just all sorts of markings of people trying to ram things through the windows, through the... Yeah, yeah. Where we had a little bike parking. <laughs> the door looked like it was like from a from an atom bomb shelter. It was just yeah. dented in, in every way. So... Um, and, and also at night you could just, you know, you could hear people trying to break into the building. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's just very scary because you don't know what intentions these people have. So yeah, very, very strange place to live. I have to say. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's sad in a way cause I, I, I do miss, I do miss the area cause it's got a lot of bonuses as well. There's a beautiful Ooh. Clapton road market is as beautiful as well. There's so mm. many things to do in the area, but it's, yeah, it's unsafe. And, and now we also have a, a small baby. So no way. <laughs> That's not going to work for, for us. Um, see, uh, I also, there, there's another event that kind of shook me a little bit. It was the, um, the Rotherham case. And I think Rotherham is just a, a kind of a, a very general name for many, many, many situations. Mm. Very similar. Um, the fact that uh, a, a nation, or I don't know if it's, it's a whole nation, but, but people in a nation would, would rather uh, stay silent about, you know, heinous crimes like mass rape in multiple mm. regions of the country than be marked as a racist or um, a xenophobe is, uh, is, is pretty startling to me. This, this would never have happened here in Romania. Many things would have happened here, but this particular brand of, of horror would never have happened here. It's not just Rotherham. It happened in Oxford. It's happened in Huddersfield. It's happened in a number of towns. And the common factor is Pakistani Muslims but again, this is unfortunate. People don't want to single out an ethnicity like that or a religion. There's two things. Firstly, people don't want to appear racist. Secondly, being called Islamophobic is about the worst thing that can happen. So if you've got Pakistani Muslims, they're untouchable for those, both those reasons. Yes, absolutely. And it's... Um it's 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 a horrendous thing as well because I feel like there's a there's a layer of, of classism there as well because these girls weren't weren't upper upper crust they were they were working class so they, the social workers and police weren't interested in them of course no no the, p- people dismiss the white working class as well which also uh, annoys me I come from a white working class family my family was poor my you know grandfather was a one grandfather was a, a blacksmith you know such a one that shoes horses like that and the other one drove the bus i'm working class and i know that the interests of the working class in britain are disregarded by all the political parties all the working class people are regarded as being sort of disposable they're, they're not of any consequence people regard them like peasants yes there, there is no party necessarily that represents the the working class i think that no, there isn't not at all 
the Tories have tried to, they, they've gained the working class vote, not necessarily because they've gained it, but because the, the Labour has lost it just because they're yes. yeah. so ridiculous. <laughs> yes. I'm, I am I wonder about the, the future of, of uh, UK politics in, in this sense. Um, what, what's your feeling about, uh, about the, the current prime minister and, uh, and <laughs> his, his recent capers? He's, you must have people like him, obviously, in Romania. He's a crook. He's a, you know, he's the sort of person that would come up to you and offer you a good deal on a currency exchange in the street. <laughs> yeah, or the step, you know the sort of person. You must. You, I'm sure you see them. His eyes are shifty. You know the sort of person you speak to, and his eyes are moving around like that because he's looking out for the police or he's looking out for fellow gangsters. That's what he's like, and it's so obvious. And I, I can't understand why. Anybody would trust such a man. I think he, he has a certain um, appeal, a, a bit like Donald Trump, um, in the sense that he's kind of a pattern interrupter. He's not, you sure. know, your usual politician. And no. people think that, you know, if they exchange one type of deception with, you know, maybe more familiar deception, like <laughs> like the one of, a, of a, you know, an exchange uh, trader, then yeah. it's going to be, he might be a bit more honest on the things that matter, but... Seems like uh, like he's he's bending with the wind on everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is. He doesn't care about. Print. He has no principles or no morals at all. He's only interested in power and in uh, maintaining power, that and gaining money and getting various women pregnant whenever the opportunity presents itself to him. He's simply. He, he, I, I can't understand how anybody could possibly want a man like that as prime minister. I was um, recently in central London on Westminster Bridge and there's a group there of Albanians that do the three cards trick. You know the thing where you have to find the lady? And these Albanians had the look of him about them. They were playing this game, but they were all watching out like this and looking around and their eyes were narrowed. They were obviously crooked. And they, it really it reminded me of Boris Johnson to a T, his expression, you know, the, the furtive look, the cunning look, the look... You know, not intelligent, but cunning and sort of, you know, looking out for problems and trying to cheat people. That's all he is. <laughs> um, fr- from your perspective, do you have any UK politician that you would see as a, as a worthy uh, PM? Uh, in- <laughs> no, no, no. No, there, there, there's nothing to choose between them, really. No, not, not in any of the parties. Keir Starmer's cut from the same piece of cloth. He only wants power. He will say anything at all that he thinks will get him voted in. He has no principles either. Jacob no, I don't. Sorry? Jacob rees I like him. He's, he's funny. And yes, he's, he's, he's a decent fellow and he's Catholic, of course, which is, sort of, you know, to me, that's a point in his favour. But no, no, he, he's not a reliable man. So, you have to ask yourself when you look at these politicians, would I let him look after my baby? Would I trust him to take care of my house for the weekend? That's the test. Now, would you allow Boris Johnson to look after your baby or, or, or take care of your flat? You know you wouldn't. Probably not. <laughs> or Keir Starmer either. None of these people are trustworthy. Yeah, but Jacob rees has raised a lot of children, so you know maybe... <laughs> yes, he's a decent man, but he's still... I don't think I would trust him with power in the country. Yeah, it, it is a, it is a, a, a the, the question of power is, is is a complicated one, especially in a in a liberal democracy, um, because you, people have a, a certain idea of of how power flows, but the reality is is very very different. Uh, and and even people like Boris Johnson, like like I said, you know, he he bends with the wind, and that power is essentially just bending to whatever comes to you from other sources. Yep. Um, yeah, so it's it's not it's not a, a very um, hopeful <laughs> perspective. Um, you I, you also had a, a video, and I think it's probably your most uh, popular video um, about very very controversial the white slave trade. Is is yeah. such a thing even possible? Where do white slaves exist? <laughs> they certainly used to exist. You know, and the Ottomans were great ones for slaves. They used to prefer slav. You know that the um, English word slave is from the word slav mm-hmm. because they preferred white slaves. They preferred, you know, a lot of slavs were taken to North Africa and then from there they were taken to the Ottoman capital, you know, Constantinople as it was then. It was, uh, yes, they, they said it was 
not a big trade. It's not quite so much now, I don't think, certainly not in Africa. It was at that time. Yeah, and and not in just in, in that time. I think in, in, in historical time, even in, in the UK, all sorts of um, conquests of Vikings used to have uh, a yeah. certain slave trade. Um, and uh, Irish slaves were a, a thing that <laughs> that, that was but a... This too, yeah, but this is been history too, because when um, the statue in Bristol was toppled and people were talking about Bristol and the slave trade, there, there were slaves being traded in Bristol 700 years before the uh, trade, the transatlantic slave trade. They were white slaves. You know, a lot of the English people were captured as slaves. They were sold at Bristol at the slave market and taken to Dublin. And from there, they were traded on to Africa. But again, it's not something that people want to think about. It's history that people would rather gloss over. Yes. I I wonder, I mean, do you, do you think that there's kind of um, a, a, a moral... Uh, core to this to this tendency it does feel a bit like um almost like a, a christian instinct from from people in the west to uh, kind of prostrate themselves uh and and uh, i don't know have this this weird perspective on on uh, on on history because it, it feels like a, a like a religious uh, act it is a religious cult it, it's it's they're seeking they're seeking redemption and they're doing it through repentance they're like these people that put stones in their shoes and go on pilgrimage to religious sites or something. First of all, they, they, they repent and they cover themselves in sackcloth and ashes. And then they hope that this will get forgiveness for them, that they will then be redeemed. Yeah, it's very much a religious cult. Yes. and, and It's the same thing with the uh, climate change too. That too is a religious cult. This is absolutely classic. This is from the Bible. Man's wickedness is causing the earth to flood. But if we repent and sort of, you know, we live simply and we don't have expensive goods and we don't have as much electricity and we close our power stations down, we will be forgiven and the Lord will spare us. You know, the flood won't come and destroy us. Yes, exactly. It's a. Uh, it it seems to be kind of an an ersatz for for a lot of uh, you know the religion that's not that's not trendy anymore. It's just not. Uh, yeah, not yeah. Fashionable. That's right. It's a replacement for religion. People used to go to church for this sort of thing. Now it's a secular cult. Now it's something that that we can enjoy without worrying about supernatural aspects and without having God involved. Exactly, and without worrying about our 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 next. Uh, or the the people close to us, you know, that used to be more involved in in, in the religions of old, in family and uh, your neighbor, you know, that was an important factor. In yeah, yeah. Now it's about uh, the peoples of, of far away. These, you know, that's quite right. Yes, yeah, but that's an interesting point as well because we now look to the state to look after our neighbor. Again, when I was a young man. The neighbour was sick. People would do shopping for the neighbour. People would look in and help, or cook meals, or take cooked food round to them. That wouldn't, wouldn't happen these days. These days, someone would bring up and expect a social worker. In other words, the government, the state, has to do all the things that we once did, and we're too busy worrying about what's happening in Africa. I've seen this with people. It's a very middle class thing: is to sponsor a child in Africa, and you pay the money, and you get a photograph of the kid. Well, it's great. If you put that up on your refrigerator and magnet on top of it, all your visitors will see how good you're being to a little black child in Africa. You may not know your neighbour. Your neighbour could, could have died and be laying there in the flat, dead, and no one's even noticed that he's dead. But at least you've got a little black child that you're doing something for in Africa. Yeah. You probably know about it. You say you mix with middle class people. You probably know this mentality. Absolutely, I've I've was was kind of trying to become a bit more familiar with the people in our in our building, but it's just it's 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 a very hard thing to do um, in in the UK. It's just people just want to be left alone, and like you said, their their problems are either solved by the market, by you know an Uber food thing that comes to you, and uh, and then you're you're left alone, or by the state through through social workers. Yeah. Not really any need for 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 neighbors, and I guess you know no. once the need goes away. Um, you don't really interact that much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's the same thing with family. At one time, uh, family was very important. People used to live near each other, live near their parents. 
And if you wanted childcare, your grandmother would look after your child for you, or you'd have a cousin, and people would rely upon their family to do things. And if someone got old, then the family would take care of them. That's all stop. Again, we want the state to do it. If you if you want someone to look after your baby, then the government will do it. If you've got an old old grandmother that can't cope, well, the state will deal with that. So it breaks up the connections between neighbours. It breaks up the connections between families until all you're left with is the state. I mean, you you live in a country that was at one time uh, a communist country. You might have heard from sort of older relatives how the state was so <laughs> important at one time in Romania. And I, I was in the Soviet Union before the fall of communism. And it's the same thing there. The state does things for you. And it's the same thing. The, the Soviets did not like people looking after each other. They didn't like neighbours, interested in neighbours. They didn't want families to take care of families. They wanted to break all that up so that they alone had the power to help people and to alleviate the stress. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, there's just a lot of family lore <laughs> that uh, that talks about this this particular problem. I think we've also had people in my family that went to work camps and people that didn't necessarily agree with the regime. It was a, it was a bit of a problem. Also, being Catholic uh, was an even bigger problem because the, the state church here um, is Orthodox and they kind of mm. kind of made a deal to be left alone with the with the. Yeah. The local government, but the Catholics did not get that deal. So any sort of yeah. Catholic mass or so was, was very much frowned upon, and people were put on lists and, and you know persecuted, especially if you were a part of the yeah, religious yeah, life. absolutely, yeah. The Catholic Church is is too much of a wild card. It's too it's too unpredictable. That's why in Poland also the Catholics were regarded as suspicious people. You know they they weren't trustworthy. The Orthodox Church did strike a deal. You know, I know Ceausescu left the Orthodox people alone, but also in Russia, the Orthodox were kind of laid off. But there too, Catholics were regarded as, it, it's a split loyalty. It's what people say about Jews. People say that Jews are loyal not only to their own country, but to Israel. And people say to the Catholics, you can never really trust the Catholic because they're, they're loyal to Rome as well, sometimes instead of their own country. Exactly. And, and there are all sorts of um, uh, stories about uh, kind of Orthodox priests that, you know, there are some that were loyal to, to the church and they were loyal to their congregations, but some were also kind of collaborators. So you can imagine just the, the, the sheer um, uh, indignity of, of uh, confessing something to your uh, to your priest and then him going and, yeah. and confessing it yeah. to, to the local. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's that that happened many, many times, unfortunately. Yeah. It's not surprising that Putin now plays with the Orthodox Church. You know, Putin represents himself as Orthodox, and you see him at these places because he knows that he can trust them. He knows that the Orthodox Church is its like the Church of the People. You know, in England, we have the Anglican Church, the Church of England, and Putin regards the Orthodox Church as his church. It's Russian church. It's safe. You know, of course he'll be in favour of them. Yeah, it is interesting now because I've uh, I've talked to a lot of people from from Western Europe, either or from America, who have converted to to Orthodox Christianity recently, and it is strange for me to see this as a as a, someone who's kind of lived in in this milieu. To me, I always regard the, the Orthodox Church with a bit of suspicion because of what happened during communism, because of the like the moral flexibility of the of the church elders and and, and what happened. So yes. um, it's interesting. Like the the author Paul Kingsnorth was um was on the podcast very recently and he's converted to to orthodox christianity as uh, particularly of romanian right and we had a whole conversation about that because it's like hmm, are you sure what's what's this about um but i think it's it's people are looking for serious religion and they see that you know anglicanism is probably less than serious uh, at this point you know um yeah. A lot of Protestantism is not very serious. So when they mm. look for serious religion, they see these like um, old, um, you know, very ritualistic, very, uh, you know, convoluted uh, things. Uh, and they're also probably, you know, shrouded in a bit of mystery because they're so foreign. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting thing to see. Um, do, do you see a, kind of a, um, a return of, of religion happening uh, anytime soon? In England, in Britain, it's really only black people that are enthusiastic about Christianity. 
we have about 10% of the population are Catholic, but I mean, that was largely Irish people. It's not doing so well. I mean, the Catholics, yes, they'll stick to the church. They still go to church. The thriving congregations are black people, um, evangelical, Pentecostal types. You pro- have you ever been to a Pentecostal church at all? No. There's a lot of crying out, um, speaking in tongues, things that are in scripture, but it's all a little bit, it's not to my taste at all. <laughs> I mean, when I go to church, it's normally either a Catholic church or or a very high uh, Anglican church. You know, in England, there's a form of uh, Anglicanism called Anglo-Catholic. You've probably heard of it. And it's indistinguishable from the Catholic church, really. So that's my own thing. No, I don't think people are going to go back to religion. Not really. But in in a way, you could argue they've they've never left religion. They've just kind of um, you know uh, plugged it into something else. And now we have all these other folk religions that that taunt yeah. us. Um, yeah, yeah. The religious instinct is still there. People crave it. It's there, but it's been channeled. It's been sublimated into other forms. Yes, and and one of the the newest flavors of, of folk religion is kind of a a, a bit of a, a twist on on the Gnostic heresy, the idea that you can be uh, that your body might not represent uh, the the quality of your soul or so certain immutable characteristics that are embedded into your soul, but not in your body because the body is just something you can move around. And, and I know you've you've talked about this as well about transgenderism, which is quite a a strange twist on mm-hmm. what's going on. Um, so um, I. I Especially the UK seems to be a hotbed of, of discussions on this um, because there's there's some kind of very old school, even pre-1960s style feminists that are exist in the UK, which will not accept the fact that men can become women, uh, you know, over a, over a handshake. Um, of course. And they're dismissed. They're called TERFs. If you yeah. heard this acronym, yes. yeah, trans exclusionary radical feminists. Yeah. And it's an extraordinary situation. That I mean, a lot of lesbians feel that they are excluded now from things because they want to have their own. Say, thirty or forty years ago, there were lesbian clubs, there were women-only spaces, there were refuges only for women. It's all gone now. You can't do that. You must let men in, or rather, I should say, you should. You must let people with penises in, because you know a lot of the transsexuals don't want surgery. They're going to retain their bodies. So you have the situation, you'll have a person who is a male in all respects, but insists on being allowed in changing rooms with women or insist on attending women-only events. Yes, and that's kind of attributed to some sort of squeamishness from women. But I feel people yeah. forget that there's a certain, you know, predatory contingent in, in the male population. Mm. It's not all men, but, you know, a fraction of a percent. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. a very scary type of man that you really yeah. would not like in your changing room. I mean, especially uh, amongst children, if that's possible. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. But even to say that, you can say that safely now you're in Transylvania. If you said it in England, you'd be likely to get into terrible trouble for that. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like... Um, this this might be a turning point in so, in some ways because one, once you come for um for the safety of children and the safety not just of of children of the of the lower class somewhere far away in some some forgotten town but the safety of your children right here uh which affects also the middle classes and things will happen you know they're they're already starting to happen with men who this, um self identify as women being sent to women's prisons and and things yeah, like that of um, course but once once you you come for the children of uh, of you know the the people in in Highgate Village or, or things like that, I feel like there there might be a little bit of a turning point. Or I hope so. I hope that these women will not sacrifice their children on the altar of of good standing. But some of those places have already done that. Some schools in middle class areas have already stopped having uh, girls only spaces, and the parents will put up with it. They dare not speak out. Yes. It's it's it is really scary. I feel like this is 
these are kind of uh, lines where I, it's going to be very hard for this ideology to come to Eastern Europe. Most of it has already. We've had uh, BLM marches in, in Romania, if you can believe it. Uh, but uh, a lot of this stuff, you know, especially especially the transgender stuff, it's, it's going to be very hard to translate to <laughs> because it, this, you know, it's not just a, an allegiance to um, an, an elite way of thinking because a lot of this stuff, that's kind of how it travels. Oh, the, the, the the people in the European Union who are smart and better than us and great, they really want to, you know, praise black lives and, you know, you know, think about transgender people. Uh, but now if it actually has consequences to their material reality, I think people here will, will not put up with it. And I think that, I hope that that's my hope, but we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. I hope you're right that these things have a habit of spreading like a virus they often start in the United States and then cross the Atlantic. Britain picks them up first. It's the same thing with trends, say, in music or speech. You know, you have some sort of pop music starts in America, Britain will adopt it, and then from there it becomes fashionable in France, and it spreads out towards you. The plague will reach your shores as well. Exactly, because I... Um, I, I, I tend to, to speak about U.S. politics on this podcast, and some people ask me, like, hey, you're Romanian, why do you care? Why is this interesting yeah. to you? Because we're downstream, we're, you know, yeah, something, yeah, yeah. five years downstream, for some things we're two months downstream. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, it'll reach you too, yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, some some very strange things coming down the pipe <laughs> recently. Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, you have, because uh, I was going through through your website, which kind of highlights a lot of your work. Um, mm. You also have a, a, a post on Polish concentration camps. I thought this was really interesting. Um, um, and I feel like the, the history of the Second World War has turned into a, a bit of a founding myth for, for liberal democracy. Everyone's just trying to find out in, in any interaction, who are who are the Jews and who are the Nazis in this? You know, <laughs> how should I pick which which side is which? Um, and you were saying that um, the, the first concentration camps in Poland weren't weren't set up by by the Nazis, but it was actually uh, an effort done by the Polish before. Yeah, Piłsudski. Yes, before that. Yeah, the the, the Polish um, had a fascist dictatorship before the Germans did. You know, the Pilsudski regime, and Sikorsky was the inheritor of this. And Pils under Pilsudski, they opened a concentration camp called a place called Berta Katushka. And there they held Ukrainian nationalists. A lot of Jews were held there. Anybody at all, communists. And they were held without trial. The deputy people died there. It's, you know, people forget that Poland was a fascist dictatorship before Germany was. And it doesn't fit the myth because we went to war, the British went to war in the Second World War in defence of Poland. So Poland has to be the victim. Poland has to be the good person being attacked by Germany. So we erase the fascist bit. We erase the concentration camps there. And then it makes everything easier. That and the fact, of course, that the Polish are very keen. I had the Polish ambassador um, complaining about me to the BBC. I gave an interview to the BBC about this some years ago, and it no sooner aired than the Polish ambassador accused them of all sorts of terrible things, and he contacted BBC Director General and asked them that, that they should um, broadcast a retraction on what I'd said, and they refused. But the Poles are very keen. You know, there's a law there. That you can, it's like challenging the Holocaust. If you say anything about Polish concentration camps in Poland, you can be sent to prison. Yeah, I think this is a good example of of our our need to describe what happened in the Second World War as kind of this this freak occurrence of a of, a, of extraordinary evil concentrated in the person of Hitler and his entourage of of, of demons, uh, and that you know that was defeated, you know that will you know, never again, uh, but. Essentially, what happened in in, in Germany then it was was a, this, it's essentially a, a story that was almost continent wide. We had a we had a fascist regime or kind of se yeah. semi fascist regime in Romania as well, um, which allied with with uh, with the Nazis at one point. Um, mm. And yeah, there's there's a, a a lot to the story that uh, had to be cut out just to make it neat and to make it a moral sure. story. Uh, to make it consumable yeah. by by the your every man, and to to have something to replace Christianity with, because that was about yeah. the time that we we got rid of that one. 
Yeah, it's 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 a very strange a strange situation that we're in right now. We're still living in the in the shadow of of that one historical event, which in a way is is, is a unique event, but also not really that unique in, in the context of, of history of you know thousands of mm. years of history. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, we do. We I mean, certainly Romania's um, fascist forgotten. Hungary had um, the region there, Admiral Horthy as well. The, um, in Yugoslavia, there were the Chetniks, you know, the Croatian uh, people. There were a lot of fascists about, but it's it's better that we forget those and paint all those people as our uh, you know good allies, as good people, and everything, as you say, can then be focused entirely upon the person of Hitler, and that frees us from guilt. It frees the British from guilt. It frees uh, Romanians, Hungarians. Everyone can then. Uh, to say that it was all Germany's fault. Yeah, especially because Romania was allied with the Nazis and then by the end of the war we switched and all is forgotten. <laughs> no worries. It was a good move. Yeah, I mean, my uh, my uh, relatives, I'm I'm descended from G- Romanian Germans. We have some enclaves mm. of Germans here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, he, he, my great no my my grandfather on my father's side because my father was was fairly old um he wasn't a fan of the of the the regime uh, and uh once um he was put in a in a in a work camp for not being a fan of even though he was german uh, of the of the nazi alliance um and then that's why he was left alone by the communists when they came in because they liberated him um to because he was a, a resistor of the previous regime but the thing is you know whatever your political orientation you couldn't you probably wouldn't have been outside of the of the work camps for long in the last century because so, one of them would have gotten you <laughs> so yeah. you know if if you were outspoken and don't don't bend the knee to everyone yeah you would have been you would have been incarcerated for for something um yeah it was a, it was a, a strange the family law is a strange lineup of, of people uh, speaking up and you know getting getting smashed down. <laughs> um, uh, I I also wanted to ask you because I remember you I've seen a, a video uh, of yours where you um, do these takedowns of books that relate to race. Um, yeah, I remember um, when I was working in in London, we had kind of a, a company. Um, bookshelf where you know the, the the founders would would put books that they felt very inspirational i remember we had a big chunk a big pile of these books uh why i'm not talking uh, no longer talking to white people about race we had this as a, as a premier book that yes. everyone should read yes. very inspirational um, yeah so uh <laughs> Uh, I, I wonder, I did not read the book in the end because it seemed a little bit too spicy for my personal interest, but a lot of people did. And it seemed like this was kind of the canon of, of how one should relate to, to, yeah. to race and, and, and commenting on race, um, which I guess just means shut up. <laughs> That's, don't, don't talk about it. Uh, so I wonder what, uh, what, what have you learned from, from reading this book? Because you, you ventured into, into, into those waters. You've actually read it. Um, I've read, yes, indeed. And I've found out a great deal about Renny Edo Lodge, who wrote it as well. Strange woman. What I take from it is that it is deceitful. I don't mind people. I'm quite happy for people to hate me because I'm white. That's fine. It's not, this is not the problem for me. So, or if somebody dislikes me because I'm British, I don't mind that at all. But what I find irritating is when people make up lies and then depend upon those lies to justify their belief. That's uh, that's dishonest. I, I can deal with honest dislike. If you meet someone that says to you, oh, I don't like Romanians, you know, I can't stand Romanians, well, that's fine. You can deal with that. You know where you stand. But if someone tells lies about your country and uses that as the supposed basis for their prejudice, then that might get on your nerves. You you might want to straighten out their lies and then let's see if they still dislike you. So that's what I found with her. She she goes, um, most of her sources for that book, she did, the book begins with a section called um, Histories, and she gives it what she says is an account of uh, life of black people in Britain, you know, the, in the early 20th century and so on. All her sources are taken from the internet. She hasn't actually bothered to find out anything. She simply looked at, say, BBC articles that have been published online. And, of course, those things themselves can be, you know, the only way to find out what happened in the past is to look at newspapers published at the time, to read books, to read letters and diaries of people. She hasn't done that. And I think that it's deliberate, partly. You know, she she claims that there were lynchings in Britain, which is completely untrue. Um, 
there's all the talk about Roman black people uh, from Roman times living in the country. It's made up. It's it's not real stuff. And nobody likes to say it. You know, a lot of white people, if you talk to them privately, will say that. They'll say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, she says such and such. But no one wants to say it unless they're absolutely sure that, that they're not going to be accused of racism. So, again, it's the thing we were talking about. Someone might give you a, a coded thing. They might look at the book and then sort of give you a look as if to say, well, what do you think? And under those circumstances, people might talk honestly about it. Yeah. Dreadful book. It's 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 surprising to me because the people, you know, the, the, the people that I that kind of see through this were were working class people, were people that uh, you know I knew maybe from back home who were working there, you know, maybe in a more basic capacity, not you know, in the in the highest echelons of technology. But the people like at the top were completely duped by this, or at least yeah. never they never showed me any sign that they were not completely buying every bit of this. It's 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 quite strange. Uh and yeah. Because working people can often see things more clearly. They, 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 the average working class person in this country, and probably in Romania as well, doesn't have any use for ideology. He cares about what what he's going to get. He cares about what people are doing, not what they're saying. It's no point coming out with a fancy ideology. A, a, a man working with a blacksmith is not going to be interesting in ideology. He's going to want to know, what are you doing? What's actually happening? He wants to know about real things. Yes. Whereas once you get to a certain level, either in social work or government, politics, anything else, you're more concerned. It's as though the ideas themselves are more real than the world. It's like, you know, it's something out of Plato. It's as though the ideas are the real thing and the world is just a shadow. Whereas when you get down to working class people, it's quite the opposite. The real world is the real thing and the ideas themselves are shadows. Yeah, so I don't know I, if I've explained that very well, but No, I think I think that makes sense. I think for for a working class person, they they're they're more concerned with their everyday reality because, you know, they, they need to work for a living. They're not just, you know, um what was it, manipulating symbols for yeah. a living. Um, and and they're also just in in direct contact with with everyday reality. You know, they yeah. meet people, they talk to them, um, cool. and they they want to make more money for their families. They often have families, which is mm-hmm. not the case often for for people. Um, and there's also the question of status. Um, status as a working class person is having you know keeping your job, making enough money to afford yeah. the goods that you need, and that's about to the point where you get but for people in in the higher echelons status is very important so that's that's essentially the, the the stock and trade so it's um it's a it's a it, it makes sense in a way that they would adopt more and more baroque versions of these folk religions um that obviously working class people don't have any time to to understand all these the language around it the affectations the the fact that there's always a new thing that you need to be careful about uh you know it's uh, it's now it's uh, trans black bodies of color that need to this month's flavor of 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 outrage um and obviously someone who's who's lower class would never have time to to even ingest all of this information. And if they were at a party, they would very, very soon betray themselves as a member of the lower classes because they wouldn't uh, defer <laughs> to the proper people. It's done deliberately. Even the use of the language is done deliberately. Have you, if you take your car um, to the, a garage or if you get an electrician in, the, these people will often try and confuse you by using really difficult terms, technical terms. You don't quite know what they mean. But you think, oh, well, he must know what he's talking about. And they'll use expressions, you know, to do with the motor trade or electrical wiring. And it's so sound, make, they make it sound so very complicated that you give them plenty of money to solve the problem. That's for exactly what it's like with the ideologue, the, the ideology that these people are peddling. They make it sound difficult. They make it sound complicated. You have to use this expression. And when you listen to them, you don't know what they're talking about. Half the time it sounds like nonsense, but maybe it's because you're stupid. Maybe it's because you're badly educated. You know, here's a person that's been to the best university and he's talking very well and he's using lots and lots of long words. Surely it can't all be nonsense. He must, you know, he must be right. It must be me. I'm, I'm too slow-witted to follow him. It's yeah. a game. 
Yeah, absolutely. A, a complicated game. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and and ta- speaking about this game, um, I think uh, an- another thing that I've noticed on your website, which I found very, very interesting, is that you are a proponent of, of homeschooling, of, of home education. Yeah. Uh, and that you've done it very successfully in the, in the past, uh, in, in terms of, uh, I think, uh, your, your daughter has, has been able to, to enter one of these, one of these places where you get a, a lot of great education. Um, yeah. it's, um, yeah, I, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about that because that's something I've been considering as well. I've, I've just recently had a, had a baby, obviously it's a bit in the future, but, um, it doesn't, it doesn't strike me as a good place to, <laughs> to send him to any no. school anywhere in the, in the world. There's, well, there's two points here, Alex. First, I can't. I, I don't want to talk too much personally about my daughter because it's her life is her business. You know, she's an adult now. But yeah, she went to Oxford. As far as home education goes, I'm happy to talk about that. You probably know that I've written a book on that subject. <laughs> I've got a yeah. Um, no, she didn't go to. I didn't send her to school for a single day because I felt that I could do the job better. You know, because giving her education, you. It, when you're at home and you give your child education in a one-to-one setting and it's all relaxed, well, then it's bound to be more effective. Delivering something like that to one person must be more effective than delivering it to 30 or 40 people, all of whom have got different needs. You know, that that, that way is an industrial process. It, it's good for schooling and educating large numbers of people. But, I mean, I don't know about schools in Romania. I can't say anything on that subject but in this country the schools run in the most peculiar way in, in real life you, you know it's not just about what they learn it's about social attitudes as well you know um they have to ask permission if they want to use the lavatory which is something which we don't have in real life in any job you don't really have to you don't have to call your boss sir in real life you know and yet in the schools you do, it's a peculiar setup. Yes, yes. I think uh, it's it's the same, the same in Romania. And uh, I, it's, it's, a, it's a strange place here as well because we had a very, very specific type of communist education, which was a bit stricter, obviously, than what happens here. And in a way, um, uh, that was a good thing. It would it would cater to a lot of the, the higher uh, achieving children while leaving some uh, lower achieving children not learning that much at all. But now after after the fall of communism, the, the levels kind of evened out and the idea is, is a bit more of a no child left behind. So people in, in, in the top echelon are not are not really doing that well either. So everything's kind sure. of down to the to the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Which I think is something that happens across the West. Uh you know, everyone yeah. surprised that's that's another yeah. disease that's that we really also <laughs> we also got infected with. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's probably a movement that I see, I see many more people wanting to participate in. Um, and my hope is that in future I could, uh, I could maybe somehow participate with some, some other families and kind of a co-op regime or something like that. Cause I'd love for, for my child to also kind of have a bit of a more social component to schooling. Cause for me, that was probably the most, the most interesting part of school. Just the fact of that. Of course. You- yeah. Yeah. Oh, and chat to children. How, how did you manage that? Um, were there some groups or, or things that you you involved your children in? There was a church, which was a big thing. <clears throat> she went to Sunday school. We attended church. She belonged to a church organization called the uh, Girls' Brigade. Later on, I ran a, a youth club at a local church. But it's not easy, and that's a disadvantage of home education. Whatever method, there's no perfect way of education. Whatever method you choose, there's going to be good points and bad points about it. So, yeah, that's a bad point, is that you don't get quite so much of a social thing going. So, yeah, it's, that's a disadvantage. So it, you have to balance it up. If you want, if your concerns are mainly educational, then, yes, home education is brilliant. If you want your child to be a social and well-rounded person, it might not be the best thing. I'm sorry to say, I mean, you have to make a decision for what's best. 
Absolutely. And I think it's, it, there's also the, the, the question of, um, I don't think everyone's cut out to, to be, uh, kind of pedagogical or, or, you know, or maybe they don't feel ready to, to educate their children. Maybe they, they feel in some areas, but maybe, you know, they don't, they don't really know math or they don't understand, you know, they don't know about history or things like that. And maybe uh, people would be a bit reticent. So I think maybe some form of co-op model would work because I, I would feel very, um, happy to teach certain subjects, but I might defer to my husband or to a neighbor to, to teach some, some other ones. So I hope that picks up. Um, and I've, I've seen some people in technology now build infrastructure for that type of, of, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that you can meet people who are interested in this that are, you know, in your, in your region and also, um, help you with the digital layer of actually delivering the stuff you to record mm -hmm. it, to, to, you know, maybe test, do tests online and things like that. So I think that's really hopeful. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm just still, I still got a few years to, to think about it, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good system. Um, before I let you go, I want to ask you, this is a question I ask everyone on this show. So you, you're not going to be missing out. Um, it's, uh, do you have a thinker, um, could be a writer, a historian, um, anyone, even a politician that you think people should be more interested in someone who's underrated, uh, maybe a subversive thinker, someone that you've gotten um, some, some interesting ideas out of uh, that you think people should read more. Well, Nietzsche. Okay. You know, the German. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But he's not, uh, he's regarded as being tainted by the Nazis, obviously. Mm -hmm. But yes, you know, if, if, if I could recommend one book, it would be Thus Spake Zarathustra. But uh, that's not going to win me many friends amongst no liberals. No worries. He's by far not the most, the most con, you know, uh, um, controversial figure that's been recommended on this show. I think it's just really good. I think people did, should should read Nietzsche. Um, we've had all, all sorts of tainted figures <laughs> recommended. So it's a, it's a good one. A uh, good one. One for the books. Um, um, I also want to thank you so much, Simon. This has been lovely to speak to you. Um, I also want to point people again to the History Debunk channel on, on YouTube. It's in the show notes uh, and please do uh, check out Simon's work, Simon's other work as well. He is a prolific uh, man of letters. <laughs> so please, uh, please do uh, buy his works and, and also uh, subscribe to his channel. Thanks very much indeed for having me on, Alex. It was lovely. <laughs>